Well, I'm really thrilled to be here. Uh, first, because all my life Montreal has been my favorite city. And second, since the beginning of this program, I've just thought it's one of the most exciting things that's happening in Canada in cognitive science. Um, it's so interdisciplinary, and the range of speakers that have been brought in is just top notch. And so I'm really honored to be a part of it. And I'm very excited that you chose as the theme for this year creativity, which is, I think, one of the greatest unsolved mysteries left for science to tackle. And in fact, it's the place where science and art come together. So I'll just give you a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about. First of all, I'm going to give you a sort of crash course in the psychology of creativity, and then talk a little bit about my own work on creativity, talk about some support for this theory that I've been developing from research on associative memory, a little bit of experimental support, and then some computational support. So has anybody ever heard of Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now? Yeah, so what I work on is the power of them. So it's the power to imagine beyond the present. So to reconstruct something that happened in the past and find some stere stere story or narrative that can weave it together, that can make sense of it. To fantasize about what could happen in the future. And to envision something that is possible and then go out and change the world with it. And our world is so filled with things that began as just a spark of insight in somebody's mind that we've almost become immune, I think, to how incredible this is. But if you imagine back some several millions of years ago to periods that I believe Steve Niven is going to talk about tomorrow, you can imagine how incredible it would have seemed to have somebody take something that was invisible, that didn't exist in the world, that was just a spark of insight in their mind, and then actually go out and make the world a different place as a result. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. How does this creative process work? And I think some of the things that I'm going to be saying are very complementary to some things that other, other uh, speakers have already talked about. So that's nice to see. Alright, so this crash course in psychology and creativity. Well, creativity is often thought to begin with problem finding, with a question, with a gap in somebody's worldview, which lends new meaning to the phrase, mind the gap. So in London subway stations, you'll see this sign. But in this context, it refers to paying attention to what your mind seems to come back to again and again. Paying attention to what is unresolved, what those lingering problems are, questions are in your mind. So some kind of cognitive dissonance. It could be also just a need for self-expression. And the creative process is construed by, uh, by artificial intelligence researchers going back to the 1950s as a, as a process of search through a space of possibilities. And then because sometimes not all the, the possibilities exist a priori, the notion of restructuring the search space came about. It's said to involve both expertise in the field and also chance processes or luck. And outputs are often deemed to be creative if they meet two criteria. Now, as one of the earlier researchers said, there's no way that we can define criteria, but psychologists have tried to do that. And they pretty much converge on the following um, definitions. So something's creative if it's new, if it's original, if it hasn't been seen before. And if it's useful, where useful is broadly interpreted to include task appropriate, aesthetically pleasing, and so forth. And most psychologists espouse some kind of dual process theory. We already spoke today about primary and secondary process. Primary process being more intuitive, and secondary process being more logical. Uh, Campbell and Simonton have come up with a theory that they refer to as a Darwinian theory of creativity, where you blindly generate some variations, and then you select the ones that are the best. Think Ford and Smith before what they call the gene floor theory of creativity, where you generate pre-inventive structures, and then you explore the possibilities inherent in those structures. Many researchers have talked about divergent processes, where you generate many possibilities, and convergent processes, where you zero in on the the best ones. I fit, prefer to speak in terms of associated and analytic modes of thought. So associated mode of thought being the intuitive mode, we're generating associations. 
and analytic mode being the more logical, rigorous mode. There is also a distinction between big C creativity, which is creativity that changes the world, uh, like the invention of the steam engine, for example, little c creativity, which is a painting that people agree that is creative but doesn't necessarily change the world, also mini c and even micro c moments, which are personal insights that uh, have some creative aspects to them but aren't necessarily something that you even yourself remember. Margaret Bowden taught, differentiates between personal creativity, which is something that is creativity for the, creative for the individual, and historical creativity, which is, in this case, something that changes the world. And another area of research in psychology of creativity has to do with characterizing the personality characteristics of creative people. So creative individuals tend to have some personality characteristics in common, and this is true across different creative domains, although um, there are differences amongst those domains too, but in general they tend to be norm-doubting, risk-taking, they tend to be attracted to complexity and novelty, they tend to be tolerant of and even to like some ambiguity, and they also tend to be open to experience, as well as some other seemingly irreconcilable traits, which leads, it, leads to them being very difficult to study. So this is a, a, a quote by Frank Barron, who was a psychologist at the University of California, Santa Cruz, that characterizes the paradox of the creative personality. And I love this quote. The creative genius may be at once naive and knowledgeable, being at home equally to primitive rigorous symbolism and rigorous logic. He's both more primitive and more cultured, more destructive and more constructive, occasionally crazier yet adamantly saner than the average person. Okay, so that's it for the crash course in the psychology of creativity. Just wanted to provide you with some background ideas. And I'm going to talk now a little bit about my own theory of creativity, which I've called the honing theory of creativity. So it's rooted in evolutionary theory. Um, my, my, my master's degree was actually in uh, theoretical biology. And although I moved from there, I still was interested in questions such as what kind of structure can evolve? What does it take for something to be alive? Do ideas evolve through culture? Do minds? Uh, what I, happened when I was a graduate student was I wrote this little computer program that I was so proud of that I thought captured in a little computer program the essence of natural selection. And then I found out that someone named John Holland had done the same thing 15 years earlier than me, and he'd actually done a way better job of it than me. And so then I realized, well, okay, but what's almost as exciting to me, or even perhaps more exciting, is not how organisms evolve, but how ideas evolve. And it seemed to me they evolved through some kind of cultural processes. And so I resolved that I would write the first computer program that captured not how organisms evolve, but how ideas evolve through culture. And that I actually did manage to do. There was somebody else who had written a computer program of how ideas are transmitted through culture, but there was only two ideas, so it's either a one or a zero. It's just showing how they're transmitted. But, but there was no progressive accumulation of novelty through time, so there's no real evolution going on. And what I really liked about this computer program is that it did seem to capture both what is similar to biological evolution and what is different about it, but what was really lame about it was how these, the creative process is going on in these agents. So I thought, well, I have to learn a little bit more about how creativity works. And I've spent the last two decades trying to figure out how creativity works, and I'm still kind of perplexed about it. But it's a really fascinating topic to study. So it seems that the mind actually possesses some of the characteristics of an entity that is able to evolve. So it has a sort of self-organizing structure. And I started to view creativity as the process by which a mind reorganizes itself to achieve a more stable, more integrated internal state. And I started to think of the external product as mirroring and facilitating and even just tracking the internal transformation process. So, whereas Western psychologists and Western people in, the, in business and so forth tend to really emphasize the external product that results from creativity. 
In the East, there happens to be more emphasis on the transformative process in the mind of the creator. You could even look at the creative product as the excrement or something that is sort of incidental to what really matters, which is the, the change that the creative process is having on the minds of both those who create works of art and those who appreciate them. So that's the sort of the, the frame of mind that I was in when I started to think about these things. So just to elaborate a bit on the point that the mind has the, the kind of structure that is able to evolve and able to evolve novel forms. Well, one characteristic of process of structures that are able to evolve is that they are self-mending. So it seemed to me that just as a body heals itself when it's wounded, elements of a body of knowledge modify each other to solve problems, reduce dissonance, accommodate unexpected events, and so forth. So just like if you were to go out and you were to bump into something and get a um, sore and it was a wound that was bleeding and so forth, you'd have all kinds of processes coming together in to, to heal that wound. Well, if something happens, like somebody does something unexpected, or if you come up, you're doodling, and then you're trying to figure out how this line could close with this line to make something aesthetically pleasing, you, you, you try to, to, to solve this. You're almost driven to, to figure it out, to reconcile it. So the mind stems up something that is self-mending about it. It also seems to um, be an instance of what Maturana and Varela called autopoetic. So an autopoetic structure is one for which the whole emerges through the interactions amongst the parts. And it seems that in a child, the child tends to develop an integrated understanding of the world and their place in the world, so a way of being in the world as well as a way of seeing in the world. And we can call this the worldview, and that tends to occur through the assimilation of new experiences and the accommodation of old experiences, so that this worldview over time jives into place. It exhibits this process of being autopoetic, so a whole emerging through the interactions amongst the parts. Another characteristic of complex systems that are able to evolve and adapt are that they tend to self-organize following perturbations to equilibrium, and they tend to find and maintain their dynamics in a narrow regime between order and chaos, and they also tend to exhibit what's referred to as self-organized criticality at many different scales. And self-organized criticality has a particular signature. So if you plot the magnitude of an event, sometimes referred to as an avalanche size, versus the frequency of events of that size on a double logarithmic scale, this gives you a straight line indicative of a power law distribution. So a small perturbation can exert a large effect. And the canonical example of this is the sand pile. So if I started pouring sand one grain at a time on this table, what you'd get would be that the sand would start piling up, but after a while, what would happen? Anybody have an idea? After a while, the whole thing would flatten out, right? And you might have a whole bunch of little avalanches, but occasionally one of these little avalanches, so one of the grains of sand would hit one of the grains below at such an angle that it would cause the little avalanche, which would cause a slightly bigger avalanche, when the whole thing might just completely flatten out. And so that's uh, the canonical example of self-organized criticality, because the whole is organizing through these interactions. And it seems that a mind has some of these characteristics as well. So it tends to find a regime between order, so a systematic progression of thoughts, and chaos, where everything reminds you of everything else. Sometimes your thoughts are logical, sometimes they're just you know, going from one reminding event to another. They fall between these two extremes. And you can also have a chain reaction of new conceptions, and this might be considered an instance of self-organized criticality. So most of your thoughts are pretty mundane, uh, what's for dinner, I have to go walk the dog, but occasionally you have one thought, that triggers another thought, that triggers another thought, that triggers a whole cascade of thought, leading to you really having a new understanding, a transformed worldview, you could say. 
Sometimes I've given this talk, actually, and there's be somebody that's come up to me afterwards and told me about some moments that they thought were self instances of self-organized criticality. Uh, one time it was a writer who just happened to see a particular event and that triggered for her a whole novel. So you can ask what kind of mind would be susceptible to instances of self-organized criticality and it seems that some individuals might be more compelled than others to take what they know and make it their own. So reframe it in, in their own terms or put their own spin on it. And you could say that a worldview is self-made to the extent that it's the product of your own thought processes. So there might be a spectrum from individuals such as the person on the far left who is sort of just a pretty face to the individual on the far right. And these dots here represent just thoughts, uh, things that you've, ideas that you've accumulated from culture. And these tiny black dots represent how you've woven them together yourself, so the results of your own thought processes. Now, it's probably more likely that each of us has some domain where we're more likely to um, really weave things together in our own uh, in our own way. Probably most people for cognitive scientists, you feel that they, that's an area where you've woven things together in your own way, but maybe for some other domains, such as architecture, you're more likely like the guy on the left. At any rate, it seems that there could be a spectrum for more socially made to more self-made with respect to different domains. And one might expect that the self-made individual would have a more unique and nuanced worldview that would be more likely to exert a transformative effect on the world because what they have thought through differs on average from what the other individuals out there in the society knows. Okay, so I've presented the basics of this theory that I've been developing, and this theory actually challenges some common assumptions about creativity. So a first assumption that it challenges is that creativity should be defined and measured in terms of the extent to which the external product is new and useful. So Honey theory suggests that it should be measured instead to the extent to which the creative process precipitates internal transformation in the creator and or in the appreciator. A second assumption that it questions is the idea that divergent thinking entails search and selection amongst well-defined candidate ideas. In Honey theory views divergent thinking as context-driven actualization of potential. So an idea is refined and at the same time the worldview becomes more coherent through interaction with multiple perspectives. A third assumption that's challenged is the relationship between how creativity and cultural evolution. So it's commonly assumed that it, the relationship is that uh, creativity fuels cultural evolution through the generation of discrete ideas and artifacts which spread through social learning. The Honey theory suggests a slightly different view. Trans it uh, creativity fuels cultural evolution through the transformation of worldviews. So what you transmit to others actually may have little re direct relationship to anything that was ever socially transmitted to you. And I'll just uh, elaborate on these briefly and then I'll go into some evidence and support for them. So first of all, the assumption about how creativity is defined and measured. Creativity tests actually do not measure both originality and useless. So although psychologists have pretty much converged on a definition of creativity that speaks to both originality and usefulness, that's not actually how they measure it. And I tried to illustrate that here as follows. So what you've got here is a schematic illustration of adaptive landscapes for creative tasks. So in these landscapes, the height represents the usefulness of the solution, and the size of these white circles represents the proportion of individuals who might give a solution. So it's inversely correlated with the originality of the idea. And so the one on the upper left is a flat adaptive landscape. And an example of this would be what's referred to as the multiple uses task. So that would be the task, give as many uses as you possibly can for a brick. And so people come up with uses like, well, you could use it as a door stock, you could use it as a paperweight, and so forth. And all of these uses are rated equally 
highly, and so the landscape is completely flat, and uh, creativity is measured in terms of originality only here, right? So all of the answers are, no, none of the answers is more useful than any others. So that's one of the ways that creativity is actually measured. And B, on the, the one to the right, is a single peaked adaptive landscape. And so this is an adaptive landscape that would characterize many simple real life tasks. So here you've got one optimal solution, and the more similar any other solution is to this optimum, the better it is. And uh, on the lower right, lower left, sorry, you have what is called a needle in the haystack adaptive landscape. An example of this is the remote associates task. So remote associates task is another common way of measuring creativity. And you, what you're do, done is given three words and you have to find the common associate. And so one of the um, examples that's used is elephant, lapse, and vivid. Anybody have an idea what the common associate is between these words? So the, what? Memory. Memory, yes, excellent. So notice that for this task, there's only one right answer, right? All of the rest of the answers are equally bad, and so it's kind of the opposite of A. Here you're measuring creativity in terms of usefulness only. And D is a, an example of a rugged adaptive landscape, many complex real world tasks correspond to this kind of landscape where creativity is a function of both originality and usefulness. Notice that the ones on the left exemplify how creativity is actually measured and they either are measuring originality or usefulness. They're not measuring both despite that psychologists define creativity in terms of it has to exemplify both. Whereas these more exemplify real world creative tasks. And so there seems to be some, uh, uh, some problem with the ways that we are defining and measuring creativity. But I would say the problem exists not with the ways that we're measuring and defining creativity, with the, the kinds of tests that we're using to measure creativity, but with the way that we're thinking about creativity itself, solely in terms of the external output. And there are other paradoxes associated with defining creativity in terms of the external output. So this definition implies that the creativity of a work or an individual changes if, for example, they're recognized posthumously, uh, if the gatekeepers initially underestimate the work, for example, maybe they are really focused on the short term, maybe the work is so beyond itself, beyond its uh, beyond how people are thinking of that day that it can't be recognized for what it is. Or on the other hand, if it's later discovered that somebody a hundred years ago invented something, then the creativity of that individual drops. Well, that doesn't correspond to our intuitions about how creativity works. If something is creative, it should be creative, whether or not somebody that you didn't even know about a hundred years ago came up with it. And these paradoxes can be overcome by defining creativity with respect to not the external output, but the internal transformation in the creator or the appreciator. So the second view that is challenged is uh, how the creative process works. And according to this theory that I've been working on, creative ideas begin with potentiality. So a search-based view implies that ideas exist in well-defined states prior to finding it and selecting it. An alternative to this view is the idea that creativity is a reiterated process of actualizing an idea by seeing it from new contexts. So what is a context? Well, by context I mean a perspective, a point of view, a lens, a need, an aesthetic sensibility that reorients or puts a new spin on the task or the problem. So these can either be internally generated contexts, you think, oh, well, what would this person think of that? Or it can be externally generated contexts. You might have an idea and you build a prototype, you try it out and you see if it works. And ideas can actualize different ways depending on the different contexts that they interact with. And midway through this process of interacting your idea with different contexts, you can describe the possibility as non-separable. 
uh, my colleagues and I have actually been coming up with mathematical models of how this might work. And we've been modeling the interaction between ideas that aren't yet, aren't yet worked out as a superposition state. So just to give you a, a sort of sense of how this might work, this will be a, a graphical depiction of the state of a worn tire. Say a tire where the tread is worn out, and it's represented by a vector P. And in its default context, worn tire is most likely to collapse to the projecting vector, vector W, represents, representing wasteful. So most times, we think of a worn out tire as just being a waste. We want to throw it out. And this is shown by the fact that subspace A is smaller than, or sorry, subspace A1 is larger than subspace A0. But say you're someone who designs playground equipment. Well, you might look at this worn out tire a little bit differently. So when worn tire is under the influence of the context playground equipment, it's most likely to collapse to the orthogonal projecting vector UE, which represents useful. So notice that it's larger for V0 now than it was for V1. So UE as a superposition is different useful worn out state the tar might collapse to some of which may be entangled. I won't go into that now. If you want to um, discuss it later, I'd love to. But uh, some of these examples might be, for example, to use it as a tire, tire swing. And I want to just uh, elaborate a little bit on how context differs from constraint. So the constraint defines or delimits the task. A contrast actually addresses it from a different perspective, puts a different angle on it, and which context comes to mind reflects how your concepts are organized and how they interact with one another. And this is a little bit different for everybody else. But the creative potential originates in the contextuality of our concepts. Concepts are a little bit chameleon-like. They sort of adapt to whatever concepts are around. So I'm going to illustrate this with a simple example. So consider the concept of a beanbag, and consider the situation where you've got somebody who was given a task at one day at work as a designer, asked to invent a really comfortable chair. And so that individual sort of sits down and looks at this task and can't think of an idea for a really comfortable chair. But uh, that night he goes home and tosses a beanbag with, a, with his baby, and uh, the next day, lo and behold, he uses that as an inspiration for inventing the, the, uh, the beanbag chair. Okay, so what might be going on in this designer's mind as he goes through this process? Well, let's look at that by looking at the concept of the beanbag. So, beanbags have certain properties, and one of these properties are that it can be thrown, and another one is that it's safe for babies, and these are both relevant to the context of throwing it to a baby, and that's kind of a default context for babies. But beanbags have other properties too. So one is that it's soft, and another is that it conforms to shape. And in the context of inventing, needing to invent a comfortable chair, this activates the property of conforming to shape. So that becomes the relevant one. So it accentuates the property that's relevant and it de-accentuates the properties that are not relevant. So it activates the property conforms to shape and that actualizes the potentiality of the concept of a beanbag. And it could be involved when somebody comes up with the notion of a beanbag chair. So that's what I mean by this phrase, context-driven actualization of potential. The beanbag had the potential to give rise to the invention of the beanbag chair, but it had to be the right context for it to do so. And we say that the state where it was all, um, where all of the properties were equally relevant is a state of, is a ground state of full potentiality, and we refer to this as an actualized state. Okay, so I'm just going to summarize now how this view of potentiality, where uh, creativity is actualization of potentiality, differs from some of the other theories of creativity. So a search and select based theory would say that you blindly generate separate, well-formed solutions. There's the notion of transforming the space of possibilities. Many solutions are generated, so the smarts is really in how you go about doing the selection. So you've got one idea, and you kind of mutate it a bit, and you generate a couple other ideas, you pick up one that's the best, you mutate it, and then you find which one works the best. <coughs> 
versus an actualization of potential view where you're resolving potentiality using intelligence and intuition. And the idea takes form by considering how it appears in different contexts that may give rise to emergent properties. So few ideas are generated, the smarts is in the honing of the idea. So this kind of uh, schematically illustrates this notion of interacting the idea with different contexts and the potentiality becomes an actuality. Okay, so I said that uh, the last way in which this challenges assumptions about how the creative process works is that it says that what is evolving through culture is worldviews and they're transforming and the creative process is the process by which this transformation takes place. This is actually a whole other talk in itself, so I thought I would just portray this schematically using an animation and hopefully you'll get something of, of the idea. So the idea is that worldviews reorganize through the exchange of ideas, thereby they evolve not through survival of the fittest, so survival of the ones that are the fittest and the death of the rest, but through small transformations of all of them. This view of how cultural evolution works, by the way, was inspired by uh, several predominant theories of the origin of life and of the very earliest processes involved in the origin of life, which actually is accepted now by biologists, although not widely known by social, social scientists, that it was not through a Darwinian process. Okay, so individuals here are represented by spheres, the worldviews are represented by these networks inside the spheres. Birth is represented by the appearance of a new sphere. Death is represented by the sphere turning gray. Worldviews tend to become more complex, and that's represented by more elaborate networks, and more adapted as represented by a transition from dark to light green. And notice that some of these networks were slightly different colors. One was blue and one was red. And these were networks that were responding more to interactions with other networks. And they were re more likely to rearrange the way that they were connected. They would take what they learn and connect it to what they know. So well, then I want to exemplify what I call a self-made worldview. And I wanted you to also note how social context induces reorganization of the conceptual network. So it's quite a different view of the relationship between the creative process and the evolution of culture. All right, I'm kind of moving quickly here through a bunch of different stuff, uh, but I wanted to give you an overview of the theory and an overview for, of the many different sources of support for it. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And if you want to ask them in French, that's also fine. Uh, so I'm going to move on to support for uh, from research on associative memory. And to do that, I have to just breeze through a couple of the characteristics or attributes of associative memory. And then I'm going to put them together and talk about how this could, could, could be very conducive to insight. So the first attribute of associative memory is that the number of neurons is smaller than the number of items that can be encoded in this memory. So this is a schematic representation of a portion of memory. The black circles represent neurons. And the orange bars represent little microfeatures in the world that these neurons are tuned to respond to preferentially. So in this case, these neurons are responding to lines of particular orientations. And you've got a stimulus on the left, and it activates this region of memory. But notice that there's no neuron that is tuned to respond to exactly lines of that orientation. So what does it do? Well, our memories can actually respond to lines of that orientation, respond to stimuli that they don't have a neur neuron that is particularly tuned for because representation is distributed. So items are spread out across cell assemblies, sometimes called neural cliques, containing many neurons, and likewise each neuron participates in the encoding of memory items. So this is a schematic representation of a portion of memory, similar to the one I showed before. So each vertex represents a possible microfeature, something in the world that would be possible to respond to. And then the black circles represent neurons for which are that are actually responding to that particular microfeature. And there isn't a neuron for every particular vertex, but it can respond to any stimulus nonetheless because of the distributed nature of, of representation. So this white circle represents 
the region that this neuron is responding to. So it activates, it responds to the line of that orientation because it's activating not one neuron but three and it can extrapolate the actual orientation of the line. So everybody gets how distributive representation works. Another characteristic of memory is that it's content addressable. So this just means that there is a systematic relationship between the content or meaning of a representation and where it gets encoded in memory. And that, for that reason, memories can be evoked by stimuli that are similar to one another. So we've got a stimulus on the left, it activates that region in the lower left hand corner. We've got another stimulus and it activates a different region. Another stimulus, it activates a different region. And the fourth stimulus is very similar to the one on the left. And note that it activated the same region because, because the memory is content addressable. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is put these attributes of associated memory together and talk a little bit about how they're conducive to insight. And this is really exciting. So we actually have some idea now of how it is that the ingenious way associative memory works lends itself to creativity. And this is something that people have been puzzling over for thousands of years. We're starting to have an idea of how it works. So let's just go back to this goal of inventing this comfortable chair and see how that might look in this memory. So let's say some attributes of chairs are encoded in neurons A and B. So A might encode something like it has a flat surface on the bottom. B might encode something about having legs. And B bed, let's say, is encoded in neurons C, D, and E. And notice how neuron C codes for the trait conforms to shape. Well, that's going to be important because it's activated by the need to invent a comfortable chair. And the individual might think, well, a beanbag conforms to the shape of your hand, but we want something that's big enough to conform to the shape of your entire body. A giant beanbag might do that. So the context of wanting the chair to be comfortable causes the concept chair to include C now. And it activates the beanbag, and that allows for the invention of the beanbag chair. So what I want you to take away from this is that the structure of associative memory is conducive to evoking appropriate, <coughs> although potentially unexpected, context. So, Insight is not a chance event. You don't have to propose that creative ideas just come about by randomly trying different possibilities. Our mind is actually ingeniously structured to, to take notice of or, or to bring forward those representations that are relevant, even the ones that are relevant in ways that we never would have noticed before. And Insightful associations actually require memories to be encoded in detail. So if the brain encoded items in insufficient detail, so for example, if chair was encoded in A and B and beanbag was just encoded in D and E, so you had no neuron responding to the fact that it conformed to shape, then there would be no associative route to get from the representation of the chair to the representation of the beanbag. So you have to have uh, representations encoded in quite a bit of detail. And in fact, the more detail that representations are encoded in, the more retrieval routes that you get through the memory. So, I said that I would talk a little bit about the distinction between associative thought and what other people have called divergent thought. So, here I've got a similar uh, schematic illustration to the ones I've shown before. So here the green circles represent neurons that are activated in either an analytic or associative mode of thought. So if you're thinking about chairs, it might encode things that are really characteristic of chairs, such as that they have a flat surface. And the yellow ring represents how you might think of this theme representation, but if you're in an associative mode of thought. So you have the capacity to shift at will between these two modes of thought. And so it might represent characteristics of particular chairs, like some are made of wood or some are made of plastic and so forth. And the purple circles represent neurons that are activated in associative mode of thought, but in a different context. So whereas the first context might have been that you want to invent a really comfortable chair, something that people would like to collapse in after a hard day of work, the next 
the, the other uh, context might be that you want to come up with you know, a doll's chair or an uh, office chair. And so in an associative mode of thought, those peripheral neurons that are activated are different. And this contrasts with divergent thought, which just says that you expand all out in all directions and doesn't emphasize the role of context and choosing which ones are activated and which ones are not. Okay, so that's it for the relationship to associated memory. And now I'm going to talk about some experimental work, first from the literature on the psychology of creativity, and then from my own lab that is supporting the honing theory of creativity. So, honing theory is actually consistent with some of the developmental antecedents of creativity. So, a prediction of honing theory would be that there would be a correlation between creativity and developmental antecedents expected to stimulate thinking for yourself because these would result in a more self-made worldview. And if the creativity is associated with childhood adversity and parental tolerance of autonomy. It's also associated with the lack of parental warmth. So it's widely believed that creativity is fostered by a warm, supportive, nurturing, trustworthy environment conducive to self-actualization. Honing theory would predict something a little bit different. So it would predict that there's a negative correlation between creativity and feelings of closeness and trust in caregivers in early life. Why? Because if you acquire the habit of thinking for yourself, this will result in a self-made worldview. And if you don't have trust in your caregivers, then you'd be more likely to be thinking things through for yourself so that you'll be safe. And indeed, there's a negative correlation between creativity and parental warmth. Now, I wouldn't advise parents to go out and be <laughs> cold to their children as a result of this. It's just a just statistical correlation. There's also a high incidence of early parental loss in eminent creators. And even adult threatening experiences which foster <coughs> can inspire creativity. This is actually the result of a study done, not by even an honor student, by a directed study student that worked with me that got published in the Cognitive Science Proceedings. So I was proud of, proud of him for that. Another prediction would be that once the self-made portion of your worldview is depleted, so that worldview that you've, part of your worldview that you've worked on, that you've really thought through, once it's depleted, you'd be less able to generate unique creative output. And in fact, this is also consistent with research on uh, psychology of creativity. So if you're to plot creative output over the lifespan, this tends to give an inverted U-shaped curve for the peak at about 40 years of age, plus or minus five. Now, this is more noticeable with respect to the quality of uh, the, actually the quality of the work as opposed to the quantity of the work, it also differs for different fields. So for example, if you're a mathematician, if you haven't done something great by the time you're 20 or 30, well then it's kind of all over. If you're a philosopher or a poet, for example, then you have almost twice as long until you're about 60 before your work might start to decline. And there have been many analyses of these, individuals in science, medicine, music, art, literature, and philosophy, as well as particularly musicians by Aaron Kostelt, and finding that there is this inverted U-shaped curve. Now, this supports the prediction of pony theory, but it's hard to reconcile with the Darwinian view, uh, which says that it's a chance relationship, in which case there should be no relationship to age, or with an expertise view, in which case there should be a linear increase with age. Uh, I'm going to move into some of the studies that have been done in my own lab. So one of the experiments that have been done is on the recognizability of style within and across domains. And I'm going to kind of just breeze through these studies because each of them could be its own talk. So I'm going to breeze through them and just try to give you the bottom line rather than going into all the details. So a prediction of honing theory would be that since creative output reflects not just chance or expertise, but it actually reflects the transformative process by which an individual resolves potentiality, it predicts that an artist's personal style or voice should be recognizable, both between domains and within domains. And at one point I was actually part of a dance group, and we weren't actually allowed to talk in this dance group, but I got to know these dancers very well. I got to know in particular how they move, the kind of clothing that they were attracted to, the colors that they liked. And then there was an art show, 
with a lot of these dancers presenting artwork from this art show. And I found that I didn't even have to go up and see whose signature was on the painting. I knew who it was by just by knowing their, uh, what kinds of lines and forms and movement they were attracted to, what kind of colors that they were attracted to. And I started to think about the implications of this for what an individual is doing, what then they express themselves creatively. And it started to make me think that someone's individual personal creative style might come through in different domains. So they have core ideas that they are wrestling with and that will come through to them in whatever avenue is open up to, their, um, to them at a certain moment in time. And so I had the opportunity to test these ideas. So one of my graduate students uh, did some experiments. She found creative writing students identified significantly above chance which crowd costume which classmate had created which written passage so that was an example of within domain recognition recognition of creative style but not only were they able to do that they could also recognize which of their classmates had created which artwork and also students in a painting class significantly identified uh, which classmates created which paintings, so within domain, and which non-painting artwork. And there have been several uh, repetitions of this since then. I won't go into all of these details, but the bottom line is that all of the studies that we've done so far find support for the hypothesis. Now, the within domain recognition is higher than the between domain, but the between domain has always been significant. I've also had students work on the recognizability of authenticity. So creative people find some outputs more genuine than others. They speak a lot about imitative art versus art that is true to themselves. Dancers speak of authentic movement. Writers speak of a period of time when they were just imitating other writers who they had enjoyed and then found that they had went through a transition after working a lot on their craft to a point where they were actually felt like they had their own true voice as a writer. And yet, when I looked at the psychology literature, I couldn't find anything that addressed this at all. I couldn't even find anything to indicate that the notion of authenticity is a genuine construct. And, uh, and I was thinking about this because honing theory would suggest not only that authenticity is a genuine concept, but uh, that certain aspects of authenticity would come out in an individual's work. So just to recap some aspects of honing theory, a creative process involves the resolution of potentiality through self-organized transformation of the worldview, and the external output mirrors the internal change. So this predicts that a creative performance might look and feel authentic to the extent that it reflects this personally meaningful internal dynamic that takes place in the creator's mind. And so we tested this hypothesis that authenticity is real and recognizable with two different groups. One was dancers and the other one was with stand-up comedians. And we found that the dancers and the stand-up comedians both agreed significantly about chance with each other and also with the performers themselves about which performances were more authentic. Another way that we've tested some of the predictions of honing theory is we've tested this notion of states of potentiality in analogy making. So I was talking about these mathematical models that we've done about um, how what would that would predict that midway through a creative process, what you've got is a idea that is actually entangled state or superposition state of a bunch of different possibilities, which is very different from searching through a space of discrete possibilities. We actually tested for this uh, using an experiment involving analogy, um, analogy solving. So I'm going to have to backtrack a little bit and explain a little bit about um, the most well-known theory of analogy making, which is structure mapping, and then I'll explain how we carried out this experiment. So structure mapping is the most widely accepted theory of analogy, and it predicts that there's a one-to-one -one mapping of salient elements from a pre-existing isolated source to a target. And it predicts, so let me just sort of demonstrate that, so you've got some kind of source, and you've got a target, you perform this mapping between the two of them. 
So what we're interested in is not completed analogies, but what's going on midway through this analogy solving process. And structure mapping would predict that an incomplete solution would lack some attributes or relationship correspondences, and that it wouldn't have anything extra in there. But honing theory would predict something else. So it would say that the analogy is expected to emerge through an interaction between the source and a variety of potentially relevant items from which the target is disambiguated. They're in this kind of superposition state that I was talking about before. And incomplete analogies would therefore be expected to contain extra elements, attributes, or relations that would be correct for similar problems, but that aren't correct for this one. You have to disambiguate between them. So to just represent that kind of in an animation, look something more like this. And so what we did, actually we were inspired by some experiments on um, intuitive antecedents of insights by Bowers and Al at Stanford. What we did was we stopped the participants midway through analogy problem solving and we threw out all of the solutions of people who had actually completely solved the problem and we only kept those that had not solved the problem and we had naive judges determine whether they had solved it or whether they hadn't. And we also had many judges rate these solutions as more consistent with the predictions of one theory or another. So structure mapping would predict that if multiple solutions are given, they are considered separate and distinct, for example, separated by the word or. And it would also predict that the solution does not contain extra irrelevant information. Actualization potentiality would predict that if there's multiple solutions, they are jumbled together. It contains extra information that would be relevant related to problems, but not to this one. And in fact, we did get significant support for uh, the honing theory as opposed to the structure mapping, both res with respect to the frequency of solutions given and also with respect to the mean number of ratings. So this suggests that, uh, um, that this also was replicated with another experiment. You might uh, think, okay, this might hold for something like analogy problem solving because it's a very constrained creative problem. But what about more typical? problems of the sort that we more typically call creative, like art making, uh, which is much less constrained. And so we repeated this with an art making task and got the same result. I talked a little bit about the relationship between self-organized criticality and insight, and that's also something that we've studied. So if so, the self-organized criticality work view of insight is correct, then plotting the magnitude of creative insight versus the number of works that are creative on a log log scale to give this straight line and thinking of a power law distribution. We tested this using an analysis of full recordings of works by classical composers in the REV catalog. And we had a graph for each composer is composed points that give a log of the number of compositions versus the log of the number of recordings of that composition. Uh, some recordings had zero or some at zero or some compositions at zero recordings, so we just added number one to the number of recordings for all compositions. And this is what we've got. So they aren't actually straight lines, they're sort of in the direction. What we think must be going on here and that would account for the fact that these aren't perfectly straight lines is the the cultural virus uh, phenomenon. So uh, if everybody starts to make a lot of recordings of a particular work, then everybody else comes on board, and so there's even more recordings of it. And also, if a particular work is uh, not one that the composer is proud of, then they might not even put it out there or allow any recordings of it to be made. So what we're actually looking for is we're seeking data on expert ratings, or even better, subjective ratings of creativity to look at this kind of analysis again. Yeah? If you were just treated, um uh, no recordings of something that's been missing data, not being able to do a lot of it. Do you think that might have straightened those lines up? Yeah, it actually would have, yeah. Uh, okay, this, this we actually haven't finished analyzing. I just thought I'd tell you what it's about and uh, the intuition behind it. So another prediction of honing theory would be that creativity is correlated with having parents who are very different from one another because this sets the stage for a dialectic that would require honing to resolve. So the idea is that if you have two very similar parents, then what you end up with in the child is a worldview that uh, doesn't need to resolve different views as opposed to if you have two very different parents and 
The child has to actually reconcile these very different aspects of their worldviews and come up with something that is coherent, that makes sense. So you may expect that the worldview would be more complex and the child would be more creative. So we're in the process of analyzing that data. That's it for the experimental work. I'm going to move on to some of the computational support for the theory. How, how much longer do I have? Um, okay. uh, in theory, like 27 minutes in total, including questions. We may go a bit further. Okay, great. So one of the ways that we've tested the idea that creativity involves self-organization of the worldview is that we've tested that the, the idea that there are self-organizing forces causing individuals to increase or decrease how creative they are in response to social feedback that they're getting. So let me give you a bit of the background for this hypothesis. So creative behavior is actually not always the good thing. There's a book that came out last year called The Dark Side of Creativity, and it makes the point that creative behavior, first of all, is time consuming, it often involves reinventing the wheel, so it can be redundant. It's also correlated with proneness to different affective disorders as well as substance abuse. And in fact, uh, it isn't necessary that everybody be creative because if you've got a bunch of individuals who are just imitating those individuals that are creative, then they can just feed the fruits of, of the other's creative works without actually going to the trouble of doing it themselves. So everybody doesn't need to be creative, but obviously if everybody used this strategy, then there wouldn't be any creativity and so society would suffer. So it seemed that there would be some benefit at the level of the society to have a few individuals who are the creators, who are causing the generation of novelty, and a bunch of individuals who are more tend to be the imitators who are actually perpetuating that novelty. So you get a necessary balance between innovation and continuity. And this kind of idea came from my background in biology, where there has to be something similar going on, this kind of balance. And so I tested this using a computer model of cultural evolution. And it's actually um, a variation on the computer model of cultural evolution that I worked on myself as a graduate student. So I'll just tell you the basics of how it works. You've got an artificial society of neural network-based artificial agents. And they can do two things. They can invent new ideas, or they can imitate ideas for actions. They're in a tutorial. Well, I know I mean that just means they're interacting with their four nearest neighbors, great cell world. Now, with the original fitness function, there were 729 possible gestures or actions with varying degrees of fitness or effectiveness of the agent. And the fitness of the gestures reflects the amount and direction of movement of six body parts. A bunch of different fitness functions have been developed to test different hypotheses we've looked at. The original fitness function had eight optimal single step gestures. And this is just sort of a schematic illustration. You can uh, invent a new idea and then you execute that new idea with your body or you can get a new idea from the neighbor and there's a bunch of input nodes and nodes and output nodes and uh, I'm not going to go into this a lot in detail because I normally would give a whole talk on this but um, just to sort of get, give you some idea of how the, uh, how the, the computer the program works so each agent can either do two things they can invent a new idea by creating a new gesture probabilistically modifying the direction and degree of motion in one or more body part. And they can also bias by learning generalization of how something affects the fitness. So for example, they might learn that symmetry, symmetrical actions are really good. Or they might or learn that uh, for this fitness function, it tends to be that a lot of movement is better than little movement. So they can invent new actions. They can also imitate by copying what their neighbor is doing. They, tend to, they only copy if uh, the action that their neighbor is doing is better than their own action. You can vary a bunch of different parameters, such as the ratio of creators to inventors, or imitators, how creative the creators are, whether it's a multi-step action. Uh, you can also change all sorts of things, like how dense the society is, put borders in there, and so forth. And so just to outline a typical run, first of all, all the actions are immobile, and everybody is implementing the do-nothing 
action, which has a low fitness, and sooner or later one of the agents manages to change that, and this has higher fitness than doing nothing, so that action gets imitated, and as agents continue to innovate with gestures and imitate neighbors whose gestures are better than their own, the fitness of the actions tend to increase over time. Eventually, more or one more agents is implementing one of the optimal gestures, and this gesture spreads through imitation. Society converges on the fittest gestures. Now, we have uh, in, in existing implementations of this, we also have uh, worlds in which there actually is no cap on the fitness of gestures, so they can implement many different gestures and there's no possible ceiling uh, to how fit the gestures can be. And this just, just shows the, um, the user interface. And what I want to show you is over time the fitness of the actions tends to increase. What's kind of interesting is that it follows a similar pattern that you see in, in uh, biological schemes where the diversity increases very quickly as they're exploring the space of possibilities and then over time it quickly converges on the optimal action, so the diversity decreases. Now, I said that I wanted to explore this idea of uh, there being an optimal ratio of inventors to creators. So explore the idea that it isn't necessarily contrary to what many people believe. More creativity is not always better. So you can, it's actually best for the society if you've got a temperance between continuity and creativity. And so what you've got here is a plot of the mean fitness of the actions midway through a run. And it's plotted as a ratio of the ratio of creators to imitators, C. And just the probability of creativity changes to a given idea component P. So on the x-axis, the percentage of creators in the population. On the y-axis, the mean fitness. And we, these different lines represent different probabilities of innovation for creators. So basically, how creative the creative agents are. And so you can see that when the creative agents are not creative at all, as indicated by the line going across the bottom there, then nothing happens because there is no change in the world. But if the creators are innovating all the time, so the red line with the dashes and dots, um, you can see that the optimal num percentage of creators in the population is around 25%. So these creators are so creative that there actually shouldn't be very many of them. And on the other hand, if uh, the ratio of probability of innovation for the creators is 15%, so they're just a little bit creative, they're not very creative, then the slope is always positive as shown by the light blue curve there. So depending on how creative the creators are, uh, the number of them is probably going to be less than zero. There's this trade-off between how creative the creators should be and how many there should be. Now, if you had a problem with the fact that this data was just obtained by observing one slice through the run, then you could um, say, okay, you should look at another way of analyzing it by analyzing what's actually happening over the course of the run. So we use two different methods of discounting. I won't actually go into what that is, but it's a way of associating the present value with the future benefit of a fit idea. We got exactly the same pattern of results. So. Um, here you've got a 3D graph on the left and a contour plot on the right showing the log 10 times the threshold landscape of average mean fitness for different values of C and P. And the fact that this, this red line in the contour plot shows that there's a clear ridge in the fitness landscape, so there is a trade-off once again. This indicates that there are optimal values of C and P that are sub-maximal for most C P settings. So once again, the more creators there are, the less creative they should be. And the next step in this was to see what would happen if individuals were able to modify how creative they are depending on how their own creative ideas compare with the mean fitness of the ideas out there in society. So, initially the agents invented and imitated with an equal frequency as shown by this blue circle here. And then by 250 runs, they redistributed themselves along this Pareto frontier. So a Pareto optimal problem is one for which you've got um, multiple is a complex problem and there is no one optimal solution to it. There are many different possible solutions. 
And so it's sort of a, it's a, it's a Pareto optimality problem in the sense that it isn't necessarily better to invent, it isn't necessarily better to imitate, but there are ways of inventing and imitating that are all equally valid. What was kind of interesting is that over time, although they all started out inventing and imitating with equal frequency, some of them, those who were doing well, ended up inventing more and becoming inventors, and that's shown by the bunch of red dots in the upper right hand, upper left hand corner. Some of them specialized for being imitators, and that's shown by the, by the end there was another cluster along the x-axis. Um, and here you've got the results of this. So when some of these individuals did start specializing in becoming imitators, other ones specializing in becoming inventors, you actually have an increase in the mean fitness of ideas across the society. So once again, society functions best with a mixture of creators and imitators. A lot of psychologists are shocked when they hear about this because there's this assumption that more creativity is better. And you know, it may be that there's actually a kind of wisdom to how our society actually works. We actually adjust our own level of creativity according with the level of creativity that's actually best for the society that we live in. I've also used this computer model to address some questions pertaining to the evolution of creativity. So this is probably the last thing I'll have time to go into. Um, it's really difficult to prove or disprove different competing hypotheses concerning the origins of human creativity because it took place so far back in time. But one thing that you can do is use computer models to see what would be the result of these different hypotheses. Do they even hold together? Are they even feasible? So one of the hypotheses that I felt was consistent with the honing theory of creativity for how humans became so much more creative than any other species had to do with the idea of recursive recall and this was put forward by Merlin Donald some time ago. So it was the idea that creative ideas began evolving due to the onset of honing through recursive recall which is the capacity for one thought to evoke another, allowing for streams of thought, allowing individuals to change simple actions into complex ones. And I've also hypothesized that the burst of creativity in the middle of the Paleolithic was due to the onset of what I call contextual focus, which is the capacity to shift between these two modes of thought I've been talking about. So one more associative, intuitive, the other more logical and analytical. And so I'm just going to breeze over this because I do expect that Dr. Midland is going to be talking about it in more detail tomorrow, and then I'm going to move on to the computer model. So approximately 1.7 million years ago was a transition from Homo habilis to Homo erectus, individuals were walking upright. You also see at this time the earliest signs of human creativity. So you see the invention of stone tools, seasonal base camps, use of fire came a little bit later, so in, around this time, coordinated long distance hunting, migration of Africa, which required the ability to adapt to vastly different environments. You also see a rapid increase in brain size at this time. And there are different explanations that have been put forward to explain this. One is that it was due to the onset of the capacity to imitate, but other species actually imitate, and yet they haven't transformed the way that we, the world in the way that we have. So that doesn't seem a likely explanation. Another explanation that was put forward was that the onset of the ability of a theory of mind, so the capacity to reason about the mental states of others. Once again, other species have the theory of mind, but they haven't transformed this planet the way that we have. The, the proposal that I've been most attracted to is the one by Merlin Donald, a fellow Canadian, and he suggested that it's due to a transition from an episodic way of thinking, so episode-based, using the real world around us, to what he called a mimetic way of thinking, because it involved mind, mind taking us out of the present because we could act out events from the past or the future. And he suggested that this happened through the onset of self-triggered recall and rehearsal, which I abbreviated to recursive recall of RR. So, just to elaborate on this a little bit, an episodic mind responds to stimuli appropriately, but these responses are always fixed. It always responds in the exact same way. It stores episodes in memory, but it can't voluntarily access them. It needs some environmental cue to bring something to memory. It doesn't act out events, rehearse, or refine skills. 
It doesn't use symbols or form concepts. And contrast this with the mind of Homo erectus, the, erect, the mimetic mind. The mimetic mind has flexible, variable responses, as you can tell. The cave girl here, she now has the idea of changing her route because of the situation that she's been, she's being chased. So she's going to go another way. She has flexible, variable responses. The mimetic mind also has voluntary access to episodes, so it doesn't need a cue to remember something. And this is because of its ability for self-triggered recall. It can go through its memory and through a chain of associations, bring up something that isn't directly related to something they're experiencing right now. It can enact events, rehearse, and refine skills. It doesn't yet use symbols or form concepts. It lacks complex language. There may have been something called proto-language around this time, which is simple, minimalistic use of language. It also has a minimal creative capacity, as you can see by the invention of the torch. Okay, now many years, thousands, and in fact over a million years later, was something that uh, Dr. Newman is going to talk about tomorrow, the Middle Upper Paleolithic Revolution, which is another big transition in cre human creativity. So at this time, you see a variety of sophisticated task-specific tools, strategic hunting involving specific animals at specific sites, colonization of Australia, total restructuring of social relations, possibly the beginnings of human language. Most linguists do believe that it was the origin of human language, elaborate burial sites indicative of ritualized religion, and also the appearance of complex art in Europe. So the cave paintings on the upper left and the statue on the upper right. The example of the variety of different task-specific tools is given here on the lower right. And I propose that it's due to the onset of the capacity to shift between two modes of thought. So if you're in a focused state of attention, that's conducive to analytic, convergent thought. You zero in on and manipulate the most relevant item elements. If you're familiar with the concept of simulated kneeling, it's about like decreasing the temperature. And defocused thought, which defocused attention, which is conducive to a more associative mode of thought. You have diffuse activation, it's like increasing the temperature and simulated annealing, where obscure but potentially relevant ideas come to mind. So you're able to tailor the granularity of your thought to the actual situation that you're in. And this means that the fruits of one mode of thought can become ingredients for the other mode of thought. So what you end up with here is a much richer internal model of the world. And the results of the last experiment suggest that you'd have individuals who might hang out more at the associative end of the spectrum, you'd have other individuals who might hang out more at the analytic end of the spectrum, and some that would be able to switch both ends from one end of the spectrum to the other. Okay, so just to say a little bit about how this was implemented in this computer model, we model recursive recall by giving action for capacity to chain them to form more complex actions. So you can not only uh, execute one-step actions, you could execute multi-step actions. And uh, I'll speed up a little bit here. Uh, we model contextual focus by modifying the rate of conceptual change in response to the success of the current idea. So depending on how good their current idea is, you could increase the spit, you could look really far through conceptual space or increase look really small. If you're not doing very well, you might try modifying your current ideas a lot. If you are doing really well, you would just modify them a little bit. And uh, this is sort of a schematic illustration of how they were uh, implemented. So the first one is where you've got neither recursive recall nor contextual focus. It differs from the second one where you've got chaining only because you are seeing whether the last sub-action meets some criterion. And if it is, you're allowed to just make more and more sub-actions. Your actions can actually become arbitrarily long. And in the second one, we change implemented conceptual focus by adjusting the rate of conceptual change depending on the fitness of the idea. And so what you want to notice is that chaining actually vastly increased the fitness of actions across the society. And it also increased the uh, and also it increased the ability to capitalize on learning. So if you remember I said that they were able, the agents are able to 
learn trends. So if symmetry is good, they will be more likely to generate new actions that are symmetrical. And adding chaining or adding recursive recall allow them to learn more effectively. It also increases diversity of actions. And then adding contextual focus also increases the fitness of actions, but only when they are in a, a point where the fitness of the action is changing. So for example, here we introduced a new fitness function. They were stuck with a really difficult problem. They were in a rut. So they suddenly were made use of contextual focus. And there there's a significant difference between the um, addition of contextual focus and without it. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Just to recap the theory, it's rooted in, in evolutionary theory. So minds, not means, are self-organizing and auto-poetic. There's a cognitive transformation through communal exchange, allowing cultural evolution. Creativity is a process by which the mind self-organizes in response to perturbation and consistency to achieve a more stable, integrated model of the world. And creativity as not search or selection amongst well-formed candidate ideas, but the actualization of potential through interaction with relevant contexts. Insight might involve self-organized criticality and an emphasis on transformative processes as opposed to the external product. And there's a bunch of support that we found for the theory. I won't go through all of it. I will just uh, say I want to say that many people are involved in this research and they're here and 